Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Medina Atefi. I am the Continuing Education Coordinator here at Microdental Laboratories. Um, uh, we have a great webinar ready for you guys on 3D printed orthotics. We have three speakers that will be presenting, starting with uh, Robert Cryer. He is the Director of Advanced Denture and Implant Prosthetics here at Microdental. We also have Doug Statham. He's the Senior Director of Sales Digital Materials at Keystone Industries, and Jamie Stover, Senior Manager of Dental Lab Applications at Carbon. Um, a few things before we get started, I'd like to go over regarding CE. Please be sure to stay for the whole duration of the webinar in order to receive your CE credit. Um, um, also, if once the webinar ends, and um, you exit the Zoom application, there will be a browser that appears that will instruct you to complete a CE evaluation form that is also required in order to receive your CE credit. If you do not receive this, please go ahead and email me directly and I will go ahead and get that to you. Um, during the presentation, you do have the option to ask the presenters questions um, uh, through the QA, Q and A uh, section of Zoom. You can type in your questions and the presenters We'll get to those after they have concluded their presentations. And if they don't get to you, uh, you can email them directly and they will uh, follow up with you. Um, lastly, uh, this entire webinar will be recorded and uploaded onto Microdental's website where you can access it at any time uh, one week from today. We also have uh, a number of other webinars that are pre-recorded up there, so you can view those as well. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and move this over to Robert to start off. Um, Robert, you now have the floor. All right, thank you, Medina. Thank you very much and welcome everyone to uh, Microdental's 3D Printed Orthotics webinar. Uh, during this short webinar, uh, I just wanna introduce you to a new orthotic product within our digital, uh, new digital product line and removal prosthodontics that we'll be offering. And of course, it's the uh, key splint, you know, soft uh, or occlusal device or orthotic. So Microdental is um, part of a large network of laboratories. We, uh, between Microdental and Modern Dental, we have 25 laboratories in uh, North America. And um, I'm in Livermore, California, uh, where we do a lot of the central manufacturing for our national uh, customer base, as well as our network laboratories um, in North America. All right, with uh, this, I turn it over to Jamie and talk a little bit about carbon, please. All right, thanks, Rob. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to Micro for having me on. Um, yeah, so a little bit about carbon, who we are. Uh, you can see on your screen here, we have a we have a slide that, that is pretty indicative that we are actually still a startup. So we've been around, uh, founded in 2013. And you can see on the right side of your screen, some of our key investors and some notables being you know, Johnson & Johnson and Adidas and BMW, General Electric. Um, you know, we're, we're evaluated uh, about a year ago at almost two and a half billion dollars. So that makes us the most uh, highly valued 3D printer company in the world for for good reason. And on the next slide, I'll show you a little bit about some of our leadership and our board of directors. So uh, our CEO is Ellen Coleman, and she's uh, best known uh, for being the CEO uh, formerly of DuPont Chemicals and, and helping lead DuPont through the 2008 uh, recession. And shortly after joining us as CEO, COVID hit, and so another challenge, and uh, I don't think there's anybody uh, better for the task. She's done an amazing job in uh, leading our company through these challenging times, and you can look around. Uh, uh, Dr. Joe DeSimone is the co-founder of the company. He's, he's our uh, executive chairman, and then some other notables being, you know, Eric, Eric Leakey and, uh, you know, Ellen Mullally, formerly of Ford and, uh, and Boeing. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about our technology. I don't want to bore you guys too much, but, you know, 3D printing is, is basically become a household name. And we understand that lots of products in the world are 3D printed. Um, you know, traditionally injection molding and, and things like that are how you produce uh, a lot of products that now 3D printing is, is showing uh, you know, capabilities to print faster and actually smoother and stronger parts. 
Uh, our technology differs though from the 30 or 40 other printers that are on the market. Uh, really quick, how 3D printing typically works is you'll have a vat of, of, of resin and you have a window and a light underneath it. And as the light projects images through the window into the resin, it uh, partially cures it. And then the build platform will rise up um, and then another layer will cure and then the build platform will rise. And eventually you'll have a part that's created. Um, some issues with that, that type of technology are that it's slow and that it produces parts that are not quite as strong either because you have that layer by layer approach. And also every time you pull a partially cured uh, material away from a glass window, you pull a little bit of that glass off and over time that will affect the clarity of the glass and the accuracy. And on the next slide, I'll show you how our printing technology works is we use oxygen. We, we pump oxygen into the window at the bottom of the build platform and that allows us to control um, the resin and it doesn't cure all the way so that as the part rises up and the build platform pulls it up, new resin is pulled underneath and you don't have that partially curing and then pulling away effect. So we can go very fast and we can uh, build parts that are very strong. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, here's a close up of a traditional additive manufacturing or 3D printed part. You can see the layer by layer build effect there. And then you can see the carbon on the right side of your screen. It's, it's laid out completely different, smoother and, and stronger. So um, you, we also have, I'll, I'll show you the next slide, lots and lots of dental materials. You know, you, the, we're, of course we're talking today about key splint, but uh, micro dental is able to do lots and lots of different applications with our printers from models to surgical guides, um, even digital dentures, printed dentures and things like that. So um, that's a little bit about us and who we are just to give you some context. So uh, if, if you hear Micro talking about carbon and their carbon technology, you understand that they've invested in what we believe to be uh, the best additive manufacturing system in the world today. So it's a little bit about, about us. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. And thanks for, you know, really, telling you know, the audience what differentiates carbon from other 3D printers on the market and your, a little bit about your technology. Thank you very much. And Doug, uh, please you know, tell our audience about Keystone and the, your revolutionary material key uh, splint saw. Certainly. Um, thanks for having me tonight. Um, actually, carbon and, and Keystone have been partnered really almost since the beginning uh, of when we got into the resin business in the dental field. So they've been a great partner of ours and the carbon technology is a great technology. Um, just a, a brief summary of what I am. Um, I've been in the dental business for more than 20 years now. Started with Noble BioCare back in the late 90s, and then um, with Procera. And, it's and I've been involved in um, pretty much every aspect of CAD CAM technology and dentistry, whether it be milling, printing, software, um, any type of the manufacturing processes in both the lab and also uh, in the chair side solutions. So as far as Keystone is concerned, um, Keystone is actually a, a company that's more than 100 years old um, and we've had literally decades of expertise in photopolymers. We're actually one of the, the largest suppliers of acrylics for nails, believe it or not. So we work with many of the cosmetic companies um, around the world in providing um, acrylic nails uh, to nail salons and also over-the-counter stuff. Uh, we actually have over 4,000 SKUs in the dental field uh, providing products for laboratories, operatories, um, you know, specialists, pretty much every market that's out there. Um, we have manufacturing um, certificates uh, for the FDA registrations in ISO 13485, uh, uh, and we have materials in stock pretty much all over the world, so we have a global distribution network. Um, as far as the different products that we offer, if you could advance this slide one, um, we offer um, for all different applications and we're about ready to introduce a number of new materials between now and the end of the year. So during these downtimes in COVID, we've been busy uh, formulating some new materials uh, for the orthodontic field as well as some uh, model material. But for the lab resins, we have a, a current model material. Um, we have uh, different removable materials at this point, soft tissue materials. And then really where we've uh, dug in over the last two or three years is in the biocompatible materials. So we have surgical guide materials that are available. Uh, we have obviously the soft splint material that we have, uh, we're gonna talk briefly about today. And then we have the um, 
uh, a custom tray material as well. So in later this year, we're gonna be introducing an orthodontic uh, material for indirect bonding, as well as some more uh, model material and uh, some removable material. So some exciting things coming down the road. So today we're gonna to talk about um, the key splint soft material and basically this is what it is here. I actually have it, this was just in a glass next to my desk, but um, this is the material here and you can see it's very pliable. Uh, I just had this in warm water. Um, it is very reliable and it basically will rebound to its original form, uh, shape once you once you take it out of the oral cavity. So it's a very unique uh, material. It's, it's really the only material of its kind in the dental space. If you go ahead to the next, uh, next slide. Um, and really the key attributes of this product is, is the quality of the material, um, the workflow efficiencies and the value delivered uh, to you from the laboratory. So if we take a quick look at the um, next slide, Rob. The, one of the key things about this, this type of material, traditionally these, mater uh, these types of devices were always done in a hard material and we will be introducing a, a hard material later this year, but it's actually this material is transforming um, a night guard solution for your patient. So one of the chief concerns about this when we first introduced it was the wear factor of this. Is it going to be able to withstand the bite forces of the patient's mouth, excursions, uh, you know, and also what it would do to the natural dentition? So we, you know, there was an independent company that actually developed a study and it basically looked at the resistance to the volume or the abrasion or the wear down of the actual material and also what the, the fracture rate would be. So each of these factors impact the long term um, for the patient use on this and how it's gonna, how it's gonna work in the patient's mouth as far as um, the durability of the appliance, but also the abrasion of the patient's teeth. And, and one of the things we took out of this actually was the comfort of the patient too. So what we're finding is a lot of the patients that are wearing this are much more compliant. So it's not a rigid type splint. And when you put it into the patient's mouth, it's actually going to adapt to the body heat and actually soften. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, Rob, um, there was a, it's, 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 once you would receive it from the laboratory, you, you most likely will not be required to do any finishing on this product. Usually the fits are very, very good, uh, especially if they're the software that's out there and the, the interoral scanning equipment that's out there now. It's a very seamless transition from your office over to the lab. But the lab is going to use this type of equipment to polish it out. It does come out a little cloudy when it comes off the 3D printer. And you can also have these tools uh, chair side. Um, so if you do need to make modifications to the, to the um, bite splint, you actually can do that chair side. Next slide, Rob. So Again, going back to the, the wear factor of this uh, technology, it, it was really a concern of ours when we first started out. And um, Dr. Mark Latta, as a dentist, um, he works with biocompatible materials. Um, he's got over 30 years of both corporate research and development. Um, he works with in the academic field as well as in private practice. He's got dozens of research uh, projects that are going on, and he's been published in over 200 ass, 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 sorry, <laughs> abstracts. Uh, he also is an inventor and co-inventor of, of a few products as well. But what he found out, if you can advance the slide, um, Warren, is um, th this material has a very unique uh, ability to change flexural properties over the temperature range of the indicated use. So when you put it in the patient's mouth, you will notice a significant softness of the or softening of the material. So the material at body temperatures are going to be much more pliable and as a result, become more uh, compatible to wear. So again, going back to the patient compliance of wearing this, again, just to kind of give you an idea, I can bend this pretty much in any direction I want. And you can see it's, it's very, very pliable. So it's much, much more comfortable. So these dynamic properties add a unique characteristic that should extend the life of the splint. Um, so these things are lasting um, three, four, and five years now. We've got them out there uh, through testing and up to date. Um, and there's very little um, wear in the actual appliance. So when we did the, the wear study, if you can advance one, Rob, we actually uh, went far and above what you traditionally would do. Um, actually, I got ahead of myself a little bit there. The bite splint um, soft demonstrates good levels of abrasion resistance. Um, we talked about the study in, in this particular study was um, if you compared it to the regular studies, um, it, the regular hard material actually um, 
traditionally they would test it through what they call um, the cycle tests, and they would they ran it around two hundred thousand times um, just to see what the volume loss of material would be. Um, it, after we got to two hundred thousand um, cycles, we actually saw that you know it had performed extremely well, and we actually said, well, let's double that test, and we went to four hundred cycles. And you can see here. Uh, the loss of the material on this is, is minimal. In fact, it's actually much better at 400,000 cycles than some of the harder material is at 200,000 cycles. So you can rely on this product long term. It's not going to break. It's not brittle. It's really, really unique compared to what you may be accustomed to providing your patients as far as uh, the night guards are concerned. Next slide, Rob. So we have uh, one of the key parts of, of coming to market with a new product is, is really optimizing um, the 3D printer to the material. So there's, you know, probably 12 to 15 different printers that are available now in the dental space. Carbon is really the market leader in 3D printing, um, especially in the lab environment. It's, it's a terrific, probably the best printer that's on the market. And we've worked with, um, with Carbon as well as 3Shape, which is the design software that Micro would use in designing this, so you would send over your, your uh, interoral scan to them. They would uh, design it in 3Shape, and 3Shape has an automatic drop down for the carbon technology. And this optimizes uh, the material to the particular printer that's being used. So, as there is so many different printers out there, the settings on each one of those printers would be unique. So, we've spent a lot of time in what we call validation with carbon. Um, to ensure that the settings that they're using when they're printing this material, you're gonna get the best quality product possible off of the machine or off of the printer. Next slide, Rob. So obviously once the fit and the patient um, gets accustomed to this, they're gonna to wanna to clean it. Um, the cleaning on these uh, parts of these devices is gonna be very similar to what they're used to if they're currently wearing a night guard, just soap and warm water. Um, any commercially available soap. Uh, we recommend um, the key splint be removed during eating or drinking. Um, commonly not wearing uh, while drinking coffee or wine. And, um, and you can steam clean these, but you want to be very careful of not making uh, the steam too hot because it, it can in fact warp uh, the product. So you want to stay no greater than 45 C. Next row. All right, that's all right. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Um, and it's amazing to see what's happening in the removal of prosthodontics and uh, orthotic devices. Uh, uh, even the new materials that's being coming that's coming out, the new uh, techniques, the new equipment, uh, 3D printers. You know, as opposed to how we, you know, we're, we've done them traditionally for so many years. So it's extremely exciting times to be in a rural prosthodontics um, today. I also want you know talk a little bit about um, designs. You know, too often in in a laboratory, you know, we are you know requested to do you know orthotics, but not specifically told uh, what type. So really, an important part of you know, clinical and technical communication. To the laboratory is understanding which type of orthotic or occlusal device is is to be requested. Uh, to you know, uh, to like I said, too often you know on the RX it might just say you know make a night guard for example. Um, when the dentist really really would desires or wants you know the laboratory to make a functional occlusal splint with either anterior or canine guidance. So I think you know there there is a little bit of miscommunication sometimes when we're writing out uh, when a, we receive a laboratory prescription um, on you know what exactly is wanted because it's definite difference you know between a vacuum formed night guard that uh, prevents you know uh, parafunctional bruxism in the evening or an occlusal splint or occlusal device that is functional or static with uh, anterior ramps you know, for, uh, for anterior uh, guidance and posterior disclusion, or you know, can, uh, ramps on the canines for um, canine uh, guidance and posterior disclusion. So this article um, written by Dr. Roger Solo uh, from, uh, 
who's an instructor at the Penke Institute, really goes into depth and in talking about these dis different uh, functional and static uh, designs uh, for an occlusal device. Uh, he you know, breaks it down into uh, different classifications for uh, these occlusal devices and also uh, talks about the, you know, the optimal designs. Uh, so I think, you know, copy down this uh, uh, JPD reference, or if you're interested in any of these PDFs that we'll show uh, that Doug has referred to, or I'm referring to, or Jamie, we're more than happy to email you copies of these PDFs. So as I said, you know, we are talking about, you know, occlusal devices, you know, different types of occlusal devices. We have, you know, bite guards, night guards, occlusal splints, surgical splints, stents. We have repositioning appliances, uh, gelb splints, a lot of different types of splints, but I think it's extremely important, again, to, um, to communicate effectively on the RX on what, what, what is this, uh, the desired outcome? What is, what, how do we want this designed? Um, and I found you know, using you know, this material, which is really exciting to me, uh, because traditionally we've you know, done this hard processed acrylic where we've had to duplicate cast and, and then uh, wax up on a duplicate model, processing uh, uh, the cast and then remounting. You know, it's, it's, it's very labor intensive, and we, but we always destroy this data. But it's interesting with this material, I found that it really replaces all the, it's, it's good for many different types of devices, but we just designed, when we digitally design the device rather than waxing it by hand, we can uh, create the proper device for the right uh, situation you know, that the dentist uh, desires. So as in uh, Dr. Solo's uh, literature, he also you know, discusses three criteria, the criteria for um, all, all devices, you know, in any in clinical situation, you know, and you know, of course, all teeth should contact evenly on the occlusal device, evenly you know, during the arc of you know, closure. Um, there should not be heavier contacts and the anterior or posterior should be even contacts. And uh, the, in, if it's a functional appliance, when the mandible goes into excursive movements or the uh, protrusion, lateral intrusion, that it should guide smoothly on these ramps and create disclusion or posterior um, separation you know, during all excursive movements. So, you know, it's said this is, you know, a very good reference article, you know, I think, for, and it was very well done by Dr. Solo in, in teaching us, you know, the different types of devices and a good systematic way of uh, design and actually for quality control. I think something like this is excellent in the dental office, looking at it to making sure that this was done properly by the dental laboratory. Also, as we get into all these new device, new materials, as Doug was talking about, which is truly exciting, new uh, utilizing new equipment through as 3D printers that Jamie and, and Carbon uh, has developed and, uh, and creating new workflows, whether you know, from analog to digital, we also have to look at, you know, you know, validated, you know, or evaluation of these different workflows. Um, you know, so I found this piece, this article, which was uh, well done, that really was a clinical evaluation of the uh, traditional analog uh, handmade uh, devices, occlusal devices, as compared to the new digital workflow utilizing CAD CAM technology to uh, design and manufacture an occlusal device for parafunction. So in, in this, you know, they found that, you know, it is a viable alternative. And uh, in, in my experience as well, you know, it's, I will never, you know, go back to, you know, if I have to, unless I have to, the hand waxing. You know, I find that we eliminate so many variables in this digital workflow 
as compared to the analog or conventional workflow. Yeah, that's, I, I agree with you, Robin. You know, one thing, if I could just add my two cents is that what, what's so great about this is, you know, we think of it as a digital uh, appliance or a digital restoration, but what's so great from the clinical aspect is that nothing has to change. So you can send a traditional impression or a digital impression. It, it's not like you have to have a digital impression scanner to access this material, which is great. And in the lab, that's where the process has changed. So really for clinicians and patients, it's a lot of benefits without any clinical procedural changes or them having to invest in, you know, any type of equipment to access this type of restoration from, from you guys. So I, that's what's super exciting. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and, the, and the data, yeah, I mean, you're acquiring all this data, you know, th you know through, if you're doing a, a scan, you're able to, you know, um, to uh, design digitally, save all that data for future use, patient loses it, you don't have to start all over again, you, you just, you know, uh, um, uh, go for the archive, look for the archive file and, re and send it and reprint another one. It's amazing. Yeah. Are you, gonna say you know, what's interesting, Rob, is that when we were testing this material, obviously there was a different, a number of different workflows when uh, working with the doctors um, that were testing it as well as the laboratories in, in the, the intraoral scanners have made such a dramatic change in um, the workflow in what we're doing. And, and you look at something like this, um, you know, this is a very, uh, the ROI or the, the profitability on something like this in a doctor's office is very high. And quite frankly, it's, it's very uh, little labor intensive, meaning that, um, you know, a scan on these things now with the different scanners that are out there, um, they're anywhere from, you know, three to five minutes to take a scan of the patient. And, and what we found is the, the, the accuracy of those scans if, if for something like this is, is tremendous. In fact, um, you know, you're getting a better fit on these devices than you've ever seen in the past by going with a traditional impression and then going um, to, you know, pouring a model and then going ahead and using acrylic to create these things. So you're going digital to digital now with the inner oral scanners. It's making it up a lot faster. It's more comfortable for the patient. Uh, it's less work, quite frankly, for the doctor. Um, I had dinner with my doctor last night, and, and he does a lot of these. Um, and, you know, in fact, he made mine. And, um, you know, he basically, um, his assistant scanned my mouth and then sent over the file, the design file, and actually I printed it myself. But, the, the um, you know, it was very seamless, very easy for me as a patient to, to go through the process and the fit of my night guard. I had a rigid one before. And quite frankly, I didn't wear it because it was uncomfortable and it was almost, it felt like it was moving my teeth almost, um, where these here are much softer in, in my mouth and it just makes it much more comfortable to wear. So I find it, I find myself wearing it a lot more frequently. So this workflow has, has improved dramatically with the use of, uh, of this. And again, like you mentioned, um, the digital file, um, you know, patients are going to lose these things. It's a fact. And um, to have that on hand and all they have to call and say, you know, I lost my night guard. Um, you can pretty much have these made in an overnight fashion. And there's no, you know, patient can come in the next day really, or next couple of days and pick one up without having to have another scan. So it's, it's a very easy transition if they do lose one. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Doug. Okay, so with this, Jamie, you wanna talk a little about traditional? Yeah, you know, that's a great segue because we're, we're talking about digital versus analog. And, you know, it, the last time you sent a prescription, a dentist sends a prescription uh, to a lab for a night guard, and this is a traditional acrylic night guard uh, being fabricated here. These are the steps that a lab goes through. And these are, these are just kind of a foregone conclusion. We don't think about this, but if you really look at each and every step, duplicating the model, you know, the, the 30 to 40 minutes of hand waxing, and then investing that wax up, boiling it out, injecting the acrylic in it. And then here you can see once the acrylic is, is actually uh, <clears throat> been, uh, been cooled off, then, then the real work begins. And, and actually what you see what happening in front of you right now is that you're destroying one of the models that you created. So um, pretty, pretty wasteful. And as you mentioned, Rob, just a very laborious process, uh, you know, a lot of grinding and fitting to get these to be a uniform thickness and to make sure the occlusion is not too heavy, um, which just doesn't happen when you create these digitally. You, you create them to the patient's occlusion, you create them to a uniform thickness, they print to a uniform thickness, 
and then you, you, you polish them up and deliver them. And you, you really, you know, if you're, if you're doing these from a uh, digital impression, an integral scanner, you don't even need to create a model. You're directly fabricating them. So you're taking that digital file from the integral scanner into the, the three shape design software or whatever design software you're using. Um, you design the splint, the night guard uh, to the doctor's specifications, and then you just send it to the printer. So what happens is just the accuracy is much, much higher. And the, the fit as uh, Doug touched on is reported to be, you know, from patients and clinicians both to be much, much better. Um, you know, it allows labs to do them a little bit quicker and the digital record like we talked about. So it's interesting if, if you don't know all the steps that go into uh, producing a traditional acrylic night guard, because especially now getting into a lab and hanging out is, is harder than it's ever been with, with restrictions. So um, you just look at that. And then I think, I think, do you have, you, I think Rob, you have some digital contrasting it with digital, right? You kind of have some design shots and stuff. We're going to be able to talk about yeah, in a minute. But. Exactly. I'll get into that, but I just want to comment on this. You know, first of all, you know, and if you look at the steps that uh, went through the pro first of all, a disclaimer, this is not microdental that was shot in. Um, but uh, this, this process, you have to look at it, uh, as Doug touched on, the fits in, uh, are better. It's because look at all the variables involved. And then the variables of the stone, you know, you have uh, one, of course, you have the impression material you have to control. And then you have the gypsum, the stone model you have to control, you know, the expansion on that model. Then you have the wax, you know, that you have to control the wax because wax contracts as it sets up, goes from, you know, liquid to a solid state. And then you have the investment, investing in, 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 uh, in gypsums in a flask, and you have got to control that. You have to control the polymerization process you know, and mixing the acrylics, whether it be compression or injection molded. Uh, so many variables in this process. And, you know, and I was always taught in prosthodontics, the goal is to eliminate variables to understand all the variables that you're given present and then eliminate those variables so you can have successful outcomes. And I think, you know, looking at the digital work, workflow, it truly does eliminate these variables that we'll get into. But, you know, you really think about next time, you know, you're, you're prescribing a traditional, just think about the variables, you know, that they have to they undergo and almost inevitably a lot of these times they, they come with uh, increased vertical dimension. You have to then re, uh, remount, re-equilibrate on the master cast and grind it down, the pin down a couple, a few millimeters. And it, it, you have so many dimensional changes. But um, it's, think about the variables as opposed to digital. So this is the controversy: an analog versus a digital workflow. So when we do design, we have these files were created, STL files that were enabled to analyze the space, increase vertical dimension accordingly, then go ahead and design the, um, the occlusal device. We can go and you know, check the contacts, go into excursive movements, look at the contacts on the mandibular arch as opposed to the maxillary arch and making sure we had even contacts as Dr. Solo recommended in his, um, his literature. And also looking at this as a functional appliance where, where we place the anterior guiding ramp. Then we go to the carbon, we get it printed. You know, we don't, we don't have to worry about investing. And then we come out with, you know, the uh, orthotic devices. It's finished down. It literally takes 10 minutes to finish. You very seldom have to adjust the occlusion and then it's delivered to the patient. You know, um, we find with the these devices, uh, the res more resilient material as opposed to the hard, we engage a little bit more of the undercut around the tooth instead of going to maybe an 0 0 010, 0 020 undercut, one to one and a half millimeters uh, over the incisal edge on the uh, labial surface or buccal surface. We're going maybe uh, three or four, depending upon the height of contour of the tooth and the undercut, just to engage a little more undercut. But, you know, the, the feedback that I've had and uh, from the, uh, the prosthodontist, and um, uh, this was the prosthodontist, Dr. Tran Hong, that 
uh, did this uh, with the clinical case, it was, you know, are, are very positive. You know, very, you know, hardly any adjustments at all because it's all done in the digital design. But you can see through this, you know, brief, you know, slideshow, so how we control the variables as opposed to gypsum. And then we can, um, we don't even have to have create models if we don't want to. We can then have in this uh, assistant, in this case, the dentist send uh, scan, intraoral scans, scans the maxilla, scan the mandible. And then um, they can also do a bite scan if they want, or we can correlate the models. And, and then from there, we, we can design the split. So we essentially don't have to have any impression material. We don't have to have any a, a stone casts, master casts. Uh, yeah, we can, from the file, we can um, uh, print another model as well with a carbon. But we, we have totally avoid the, um, all the variables um, of and controlling these variables in, in with stone models. And then, you know, with the best part about it is we retain all this data. Uh, as uh, Doug and Jamie, you know, said, you know, when, if the patient ever loses this appliance, the, this appliance, we have this data. You scanned it all in chairside. We retained it. We archived it for you. And then we, we can um, retrieve this data whenever we want. If the patient needs another one or you want to modify it, say if you want to increase the vertical a little bit more we, we did, uh, over a period of time, we just uh, increase the vertical, add to it, and then print another one. So there's um, a lot of uses, but it's amazing just to, just to have this data. I think the data in, is truly the differentiator between the analog and the digital workflows and removal prosthodontics. Uh, you know, Rob, Jamie, you mentioned one thing earlier about the undercuts. Um, I, I think one thing that makes this material unique, and maybe, Jamie, you can add to this too, but um, if you think about a traditional hard night guard, you couldn't really engage the undercuts because the, the material was just too stiff and it would actually lock in the patient's mouth. If the patient, if you want to engage more of these, what sometimes we'll, we'll suggest is that the patient just um, put the night guard into some water before if they if they do have contact with the uh with the undercuts they put it in a warm water or just a glass of warm water before they put it in their mouth they put it in and then it will actually form in and around the teeth um, in the morning when they take it out um the, the material will go back to its original form so it literally will rebound it back to its exact position where it was before um, it got warm so, yeah ab absolutely it's it it's like a almost like a hard soft i i it, it's it's the way that it fits is so unique and the way that it functions, it, it, it's comfortable and it feels soft, but the soft in the name, the key splint soft clear is almost to me a misnomer because it's a very rigid material. This is one I have here that uh, I, I did a while back. It's not polished as you can see, this was just right off the printer and then cured. So it's a little bit cloudy, but it's, it's you know, I've had clinicians ask me, well, man, I, I don't know that I want a soft night guard. You know, I don't think that's gonna, be durable enough so um it's it actually although it functions like a hard night guard it fits and is comfortable like a soft so um yeah it, patient compliance is is much much higher and i've, I've actually had you know doug you mentioned you you actually this is one of the first ones that you can wear and i've had a couple labs that have made these for their their dental clients their own personal use who weren't able to tolerate a night guard and now now like these so um I, if, if I had one request, I would be that um, Keystone would drop the, the soft. I, I, I bugged Doug about this before. I'm like, why did you guys put soft in there? Because it, uh, it actually uh, can scare some, some uh, clinicians into, away, you know, into thinking that it's actually not going to be a durable product. So just teasing, Doug. That's all right. It's, I, I would say flexible is a good way to describe it as well. So. Yeah. No, it's extremely flexible. I mean, when you have it in your hand, and this is feedback we, we've received from, uh, from dentists that you know, the patient will put it in their hand and, it'll, and it, feel, it looks comfortable. It flexes, it moves, and um, it functions. But you put it into the mouth and you can still you know, create um, you know, functional movements, you know, a functional appliance uh, when, you go, when the mandible goes into excursive movements. So you, 
it's still a how like you, know, you said, Jamie, all the you know um, design properties of a a hard splint, but it is much more comfortable. And I think it's to a patient, you know, it seems like you know comfort and function is extremely extremely important. Right, and you know, you're talking about the analog versus digital, and I think it, you know between the three of us chatting here, I, there's probably what. 60 or 70 years combined or something like that in the dental industry between, between all three of us. And we've, we've seen our share of analog. And really what, what we're talking about is the fact that the digital transformation is just now in the last couple of years happening to the removable part of our field, right? I mean, we know Fix went through this over a decade ago, uh, uh, you know, going from hand waxing and casting PFMs to milling zirconia crowns and and Emacs, and I, now the, the vast majority of what's done are, are those types of crowns. You know, probably zirconia crowns are 75 or 80% or something of what's done out there today, and that's completely a digital process. And, and so what we're really talking about is the fact that now in the removable realm, we're able to access this technology and these materials and, and pick up those efficiencies. Actually, in the removable, the, the digit, to, to digitalize the whole process, is, it's much easier and more efficient than even in the crown and bridge if i go back 20 years ago when procera was first out there all that stuff was still done analog they would send over you know uh, an impression they would pour a model they'd scan the model and then make a crown for it so it was still somewhat cumbersome as far as the workflow but and you had to worry about undercuts and you had to worry about a lot of other things when you were doing that stuff and picking up finish lines but the, the inner oral scanners that are out there now just in the last five years, how much they've changed in advance has really made everybody's job a lot easier and, and the patient experience much, much better as well. So, Absolutely. And I, I love the comparison to the traditional acrylic, um, you know, material and traditional acrylic night guard. Because as we know, there's there's the acrylic process night guard and there's the thermoform type or the, the suck down type. And uh, really that's a completely different animal. It's strength and durability characteristics and even it's fit. Uh, are just not really comparable. So uh, for those of you wondering, if you haven't seen this, it, it, it very much compares to a traditional acrylic uh, night guard. It's, it's, that's why I'm glad we showed the video of, the, of that night guard being fabricated versus a thermal form because completely different animals. I think that's worth noting. Yeah, with the vacuum form night guard, patients tend to grind into it and seek an interference and it actually creates more problems over a period of time and, and that's, you know, it's marketed as a soft material, but this, you know, soft material, like I said, you know, you can't grind into it and you just, you can design it so it can be functional as well. So yeah, it is, uh, it's amazing what's happening in a rural prosthodontics, extremely, extremely exciting, you know, to be a part of these uh, changes and uh, look looking forward to, you know, what's, what's gonna happen in the future removal you know, with all, uh, as we transition into digital workflows. Yeah, so we offering this, um, these digital workflows, you would, you would really like to get to almost, we have a complete digital workflow. I mean, yeah, you, know, you can take impressions, you can create models, but the, the, the optimal workflow is really a complete digital workflow where in the uh, clinically chair side, you're scanning, you're sending us files, and uh, then we, from your files, we'll design the, the occlusal device and then uh, finish it down. We can print models as well and then, and then adjust it to those models if needed and then uh, send you back models if you uh, request and then um, uh, send you back the occlusal device without any impressions, without any uh, uh, stone cast, investing or anything. But you know, to do this, you know, we support all intraoral device, scanning devices at you know, micro dental and modern dental. Uh, you can just you know call us up, you know, and um, get our protocol for sending the files to us. Our customer service, you know, more more than happy to help you out, and then uh, connect you with uh, one of the technicians um, who will you know discuss you know uh, creating the occlusal device uh, with you. So with that, you know, any, we'd like to take some questions. Any questions? Um, 
some reason I cannot see the question area. Maybe Doug or Jamie, can you uh, see if there's any questions? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, if anybody, right. on, yeah, if anybody, right. on, oh, I was just gonna say if anybody on the, on the, um, kind of on the operational side of it can, can, uh, chime in, that would be correct. Yeah. Be um, so I, I have one here. I, I just see one that was, uh, sent to me. Um, there's uh, Dr. Jeffries in Denver would like to know, uh, how do I explain the difference in a traditional hard, splint to my patients, which is, you know, how do you, I guess, how does he, you know, talk to his patients that has had a hard splint and what is this material? Um, Doug, do you have any ideas for that? Well, obviously the hard splint is, for me anyways, my personal experience is that when you put it in your mouth, it almost it makes my teeth feel claustrophobic. It's like tight, like almost like an orthodontic appliance, like a clear liner almost, but even stiffer. Um, where this material more, I think, resembles um, a, almost like a sports guard. So, you know, if you think about, you know, when you had to wear a night guard or a, a sports guard playing basketball or whatever else, um, it's much more pliable. Your teeth are much more comfortable. It's not as bulky as that, but the, the, you get a similar sensation uh, from this material um, to a sports guard than as a, opposed to a traditional one. So it's going to be much more comfortable. You'll give them that. Um, you know, the protection that you give them a night guard for. So, um, you know, that's where I find the uh, easy way to describe it to a patient as far as the wear. Right. I, you, dentist, for the most, my brother's a, a prosthodontist and, uh, you know, I, he and I have worked together quite a bit and, you know, just kind of brainstormed on uh, pa patient communication and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, obviously everybody has their own approach. Keeping it simple is, is probably probably good. And so I love what Doug just said. I mean, just comparing it to something like, like a sports guard, um, like a stronger sports guard. I think the fact that, I, I mean, having a sample is, is always a good idea on hand to actually let them, you know, uh, hold it in their hand and, and, and see it. That's, that's probably a, a really good way to help, help to, you know, show it to the patient or sell it to the patient. If we could say that, and, you know, patients, we all value technology in our lives today, right? We all understand that the world is, you know, much different because of digital technology. We have it in our homes, we have it in our cars, and our kids are using it now. And, you know, it's it's called school now for most for most of our kids is <laughs> online. So I, I think you know, just you know, letting them know that hey, if this is you know not done the traditional hands-on way, it's it's taking advantage of technology and the fact that that dentist partners with Micro, which is a, a lab that's on the cutting edge of technology. And uh, I, I think it's worth mentioning to them about, you know, if something happens to it, we can reproduce it uh, quicker for you if your dog eats it or, you know, you lose it or something like that. So I, I think letting them know about some of the benefits aside from fit are important as well. Exactly. Exactly right. Well, like I said, you know, the data, and we all agree, is a huge, huge benefit. It's almost like an insurance policy, you know, and uh, in a digital workflow. Okay, let's see, any other questions? Um, I see one over here from Glenn Smith. Uh, can we touch on the informity of orthotic? The informity? I'm sorry. Yes, of the, yeah. of the orthotic. Uniformity. Oh, uniformity, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Hey, Glenn, uh, thank you for uh, attending the webinar. So uh, if you're referring to the, the uniformity in regard to the digital you know, design, um, you know, we usually, you know, will design this, you know, splint to try to be, you know, two, two, two to three millimeters thick, but, you know, but yet um, uh, we, we also, you know, uh, designed it with a um, zero spacer and the occlusal, you know, uniform, if you're referring 
I'm sure you're referring to more palatal and buccal and labial if you're referring to a max, maxillary or thought occlusal device. But on the occlusal, as you know, you know that's determined by the amount of increased vertical dimension uh, prescribed by the dentist. And if we're talking about uniformity of thickness of material and occlusal adjustments also, uh, as we showed, you know, when you, when you see them layering the wax on by hand, even if the most experienced waxer, you're, it's not possible to get that uniform thickness all the way while, while laying hot wax on with a spatula. Well, when you are designing it in the digital software, whatever thickness you tell that wall to be or that occlusal to be, that's exactly what the printer is, is duplicating. And then there's no adjustments or checking on the articulator in the lab before sending it to the, to the clinician and the patient. So um, the, the uniformity of, of thickness of material is spot on. It's, it's excellent. Yeah, and, and exactly. And also to that extent, you know, you're not changing the uniformity as you are when you're compression molding uh, one of a, an occlusal splint where you will tend to increase vertical dimension and change the uniformity you know, through the, um, through the uh, compression molding process. So uh, digital, you know, once you set the parameters, it, it stays, yes? Glenn was also saying that he was speaking on design from tech to tech. Gotcha. Oh, you know, so yeah, and that's absolutely uh, true that different technicians, as well as we look at things, uh, different terminologies used, we will design things, you know, differently. Some uh, will, you know, create much uh, arbitrarily increase the vertical dimension, increase it substantially, uh, you know, make it much thicker. Some very, very, very thin, uh, all, you know, it's, Whereas in a uh, digital workflow, it's a little bit different. I think you set your parameters and uh, you can uh, create much more uh, consistency in, de in the design from technician to technician uh, with, a, with a laboratory environment. Rob, if I could add a little to that, I think that uh, with the digital workflow the way it is, uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. And, and this goes back again to my earlier days in, in milling at the design of this stuff is, is can be, um, you can almost sometimes recognize the work like a great artist, you could recognize the work of, a diff of different technicians. The beauty of the workflow here is that you can take the design, the technician or the designer can send it back to the doctor and have them take a look at the designs. And if there's certain parts of the design that he'd like to see made different, then they can make changes, you know, um, to it. So, you, you know, this, uniformed um, thickness, for instance, some areas you might want to make thicker than other areas in order to take certain teeth out of occlusion, for instance. So you can have some design uh, input on that with the technician. And I would strongly encourage that because, you know, every patient is different. So um, the design from one tech to another can certainly be different. Okay. Okay, we have another question from um, anonymous attendee. How long is the scan file saved in the system if we have to redo another set? I think that so. <laughs> yeah, so this indef archived indefinitely, you know, in, into our system. Um, but um, you know, it's I would recommend you know you know probably updating the scan file you know occasionally. Um, you know, as, as we all know, teeth you know tend to move, things change in the oral environment. So um, I, I think you know, what's really good with the digital workflows is that we can um, take an existing um, a scan file uh, and then maybe uh, a year later, take another scan of the patient and then register that with the previous scan and then update our scan, our digital file on the, our patient's digital file. I think that's you know gonna be the future that we will have more digital files as we have radio, you know, radiographic files where we, you know, have different so-called x-rays on file for the patients, um, did, uh, did, uh, file, we'll we will have this digital design file, um, whether it be for orthotics or prosthetics, you know, where we adjust dentures and then, you know, updating the design file by rescanning and registering that uh, with the previous file. So to answer the question, it's indefinite, but 
you should always up, you know, periodically update that file. Okay, and then also Nathan McKay has a question. Um, can you utilize or order this Keystone Flexible Soft in other splint designs other than just as a full occlusion, i.e. as a full occlusal with anterior guide or with a, a dislu in a posterior upon lateral anterior excursion? And then the second part of that question is, do you prefer both a CO bite and a leaf gauge upon by a register upon scan? That was a long one. <laughs> I'll take the first part of that with, um, as far as the utilization of the material. Um, we are working with an awful lot of people right now doing um, sleep appliances of many, many different designs. Um, so as far as the flexibility of the material to be used for other applications, uh, it's not indicated for anything other than a night guard right now, but I think you will see by the end of this year, you'll probably see more and more applications being uh, applied to this. Um, so you can really design pretty much any design you want and how you want to use it. Uh, and the printers that are out there now, will, you know, we can print hinges on a, on a printer now. So it's, we can pretty much print anything that you design. So um, there is no limit to it other than the FDA and the CE um, or, or the ISO certifications that are on the product. So right, you know, we have to go through the proper protocol to make sure that the, the material is validated on the printer. Um, the post-processing is validated and also, you know, it's FDA approval for whatever application it's going to be uh, used for. And also add to that is, uh, uh, if the question is regarding can the uh, material be used also for functional or a static occlusal device with anterior, you know, uh, ramps or, you know, for uh, posterior disclusion. I mean, the answer is yes, you know, as we when the patient goes into a protrusion that it can guide easily and firmly against this uh, lingual ramp. And in regard to a bite scans, um, yes, we'd you know, love you know, to take scans you know, at the desired increased vertical dimension, uh, uh, a, a bite scan at that, rather than you know, just allowing us to correlate the models and open them up on the software. I think anytime you can give us more information at your desired um, increase uh, VDO is, is very is important, whether it be with the leaf gauge or any type of um, reporting uh, material or device. Any, any, any other questions? Uh, that's going to do it for the questions. I want to thank all you guys for your informative presentation. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, to remind the attendees that you can uh, view this webinar one week from today on Microdental's website. Also, please don't forget to uh, fill out the evaluation CE form and submit that in for your CE credit. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, have a great evening and hope to see more of you uh, during our up and coming webinars. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very Bye. much.